Well, welcome to another Dino's Diary. Um, this is the River Trent and a very special part of the River Trent because it's Collingham Weir. Um, I'm far from an expert, but I've had two trips um, in the last couple of years, both resulting in extremely big fish and quite a few of them. Um, but the most special part of this part of the river for me is that it's a very sociable part of the river. We've got runes, my old mate Nigel Bobaway and Gazza, who's going to net this fish hopefully for me if it comes in. And you will fish within 10 yards of each other pretty much, whereas all my other barbel fishing is so unsociable, you're on tiny little rivers, sneaking around, trying to not let people know what bait you're on and, and what swims you're catching from. But here, it's not difficult fishing if I'm absolutely honest, albeit these are the most challenging conditions that I've seen. Low, clear, extremely sunny. But quite frankly, if you fuzz one up in the weir and you've got a good bait on, they find it because there seems to be probably more fish in this weir than I've ever fished for any, anywhere else in the country, barbel-wise. It's absolutely awesome. It's beautiful. It takes a hell of a lot of man's gear as well because quite often you're fishing with six and eight ounces of lead, even more sometimes, but anyway, I'm waffling on because I'm attached to a, a wonderful Trent barbel. I'm gonna go and land this one, so I'll see you in a bit. There he is. Drop your back, in you go. Oh. Boom. Perfect. Well done, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll ding dang do. Yeah. I've always loved fishing weir pools. I think they're sort of a little bit more manly than the rest of the river because it's always raging. You've always got that drone in the back of your mind. And whenever you're fishing a weir pool, from my experience, whether it's the River Lee, the River Kennet, or up here on, on the Trent here at Collingham, which quite frankly is one of the biggest ones I've fished in the UK, you always need man's gear, so you feel like you're fishing for something big, even if they ain't there. Yeah, 9.15. It's the first time, actually, this is the first time I've actually had rods up in what you would call the dolly hole swims, A1 and 1, um, which generally are the places to be to get bites during the day. Um, it's a little bit tougher this trip because it's freezing cold, the water is like ice. Um, sun's out, it's low, clear, so realistically we probably should be on maggots, but we're fishing bags anyway. Um, but it's an amazing place because from peg two all the way down to 10, you, you're very lucky if you get a bite during the day. It's all up in the first two. But come dark, I don't know whether the fish push down or the fish that live in them sort of swims just turn on, I don't know. I think it's a, a little bit of both, but you'll struggle to get a bite up in the weir at night, but the other swims proper kick in. So you can, get, you can come down here with three or four of you, and it's a little bit of sort of a game of two halves. A couple of you have bites in the day, it's lovely jubbly, and then come night time, you have a bit of kip and everyone else's rods just start kicking off. It really is, it's a bit of a phenomenon really. I don't know anywhere else in the country that holds the volume of fish that this does, and certainly the size as well, because every time I've been here, I've seen big ones. There we go, first one, nine pound 15, oh so close to another Trent double. And the best thing about this is we are spaced out in the first four or five swims and it can literally go off with a three pounder or a 15 pounder at any time on any one of these swims. Superb. Thank you, darling. When you are ready. Look at that, like a race car. Woo. As that fish headed back to the snaggy weir, we rechucked all the rods and reset the traps. And I didn't have to wait too long. Well, I mentioned on the first opener, it's the worst conditions ever, but in the worst conditions ever, there's one place you want to be and that's here. Because quite frankly, the fish live up there. There's, I don't know, I wouldn't like to take a guess how many there are, but there's certainly a few. Um, and we are keeping it ever so simple. I would have thought that quite frankly, if you was prepared to sit on a box and fish maggots properly, you could probably still empty it in these conditions. But we're not, we're here for a social, it's a bit of fun. And as with all my fishing, we're keeping it nice and simple. And it's not prolific like I've seen Collingham Weir, but trust me, come dark, there's a few swims downstream that will start kicking in. Gaz, you look like you're line dancing. You swam straight in. <laughs> you made it look easy. <laughs> Top man, number two. Okay. There we go, number two. And for this place, believe it or not, it's a proper little bambino. Look at that angry little bugger though, look. Dorsal fins right up. Thank you, darling. They all count this time of year. I've never been one to complicate rigs or bait. And once I find one or two that work exceptionally well, 
I use them, that's it. I don't want to be in there scratching for bites, thinking that it's either my rig or my bait. Once I'm settled, that's it. It's all about location. And in my very limited experience up here on the trend, I have found a couple um, that have certainly outscored everything else. Um, and it's probably the only river where I've actually found that this works perfectly, like it's mega. Um, on a big river like this, especially after dark, everyone goes for big baits. Um, and I'm not necessarily the same as that. Smelly, yes, but I don't think if it smells enough, I don't think size makes a difference. And so I quite frankly use the crab goo on any hook bait there is. I mean, this is the link dumbbells. They're superb and beautiful size. They're sort of 14 mil by 12 mil. And the garlic goo, out of those two, I've done so well that they are the only two hook baits that I brought. Obviously I've got pellet, I've got some free boilies to, throw, to fuzz out, I've got a little bit of ground bait and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you know, the ground bait, the pellet, they'll eat pretty much most that you put in front of them. But the hook bait, which is the end of the rig, that's the most important part. And I've got so much confidence in these good up baits now, I wouldn't leave home without them. So, whilst I rebaited, the boys got stuck in. Rooney was up first and he bagged his little cracker. Then it was Gazza, who was forced to play his fish from all over the shop. Finally, he got the upper hand and he was off the mark. That, my friend, is your first Trent double. <laughs> yes. Great start for the boys and it went from strength to strength. Well, it looks like it's kicking off on Colin and Weir. <laughs> Great start for Rooney. The man was on fire. You the man. You the man. Feast your mince pies on my old mate Gaz, who's going to talk you through some rigs. Well, I've fished a lot of different rivers over the years. It's only the second time I've been on the Trent, though. And I'm just going to run you through what I'm using tackle-wise, but it's quite different fishing to what you experience on a lot of rivers here. Uh, using two and a quarter pound test curve rods, uh, quite a heavy rod for barbel. Um, but you need, you need this heavy gear because of the size of ledge you use in the size of the river as well. You're casting quite long distances. And for that reason as well, I'm using a big reel. Uh, it's a 10,000 size bait runner reel, uh, loaded up with 12 pound touchdown. Uh, again, that sounds heavy, but you need that sort of strength line because uh, I'm using six or eight ounce leads on that. Um, they're fished on a lead clip, um, just in case I get snagged on rocks. There's quite a few in this weir pool we're fishing. Uh, the lead can come off. Uh, that's fish running style though, just to give me a bit more idea what's going on in the swim. Uh, to create that, I literally just get a pair of pliers, crush down the eye, top eye of the swivel a little bit, just to make it oval shaped, and then that stops it locking into the nose of the leg clip, uh, just so it's creating a running style rig. Uh, hook link wise, uh, quite often I'll use something like 12 pound fluorocarbon, um, which is normally all right, but because of all the rocks in here and other snags, I would say a little bit stronger. So I've actually gone for 30 pound armor cord, which again, sounds ridiculously heavy, but it's quite a thin braid, but it's very tough. Um, you go around a rock, you're not going to do too much damage to it unless it's something really extreme. On the end of that, I've got a size eight wide gape hook, a uh, nice strong hook. Uh, with these, once they're in, you know they're going to stay in. It's very rare you get a hook pull with barbel anyway. Uh, fishing quite a short hair with those, just with a dumbbell hook bait. Um, I will go longer on the hair if I'm getting trouble from bream or chub. Uh, then to try and get around that, uh, lengthen the hair a bit, and you certainly avoid the chub with that. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's pretty much it. It's nice and simple, uh, very strong and reliable. That's all you need for this sort of fishing, really. But my old mate Nigel had to show some patience and wait his turn. For about 15 years, I used to love it here. I've had doubles here in the past, but uh, seeing these boys catching has really got me going. But I'm the end peg, the worst end, but it's big fish or bust for me. And I think after dark, the fish are gonna move down. And lovely to see Dino get off the mark. And then the Rune has played a blind, the typical matchman, he's banged four out in a row, he's top rod. But hopefully tonight, when it gets dark, those fish are gonna come down here. I've only bothered putting one rod out at the moment because I'm waiting. And I thought, yeah, I'd rather rest the swim. But as it gets towards dark, I'm gonna be feeding regularly. And I reckon there's gonna be a big one out there with my name on it. It was my turn again, and this one felt like Moby Dick himself. My experience in weir pools is that the fish can quite frankly come from anywhere, but where you put your bait is extremely important because weir pools generally are quite snaggy. Rocks, dead trees, you name it, comes over the top every single time, and it changes from year to year, week to week, month to month. So I think the most important tip I can give someone going into fish a weir pool that they've never seen before, or that they have seen before, is to flick a lead out without a rig on it first. Just drag it back and make sure that the spots or the creases that they want to fish are presentable. Because the last thing you want to do is have your lead bouncing around 
which you shouldn't do anyway, but the last thing you want to do is be chucking it into a snag because if you hook a fish and you lose it, you can't brag about that and it's bad angling. Make sure you're fishing on something that's presentable and then go for it. It was a little bit bigger than it looks, yeah. 14 14. <laughs> well, I've mentioned that I've had a couple of successful trips here before. Um, I've never fished the dolly hole, i.e., peg one and peg A1. And so I thought, do you know what? I'll have the first 24 hours in there. Who cares? And it hasn't been prolific, but my luck has continued. <laughs> This bad boy, after an epic battle, it got me completely snagged up, so I had to wander up the wall pretty much to the weir to get above it. That <laughs> is the biggest barbel I've ever caught on camera. Not the biggest barbel I've caught in my life, but that is 14-14, and anywhere you go in the country, that is a chunk, an absolute beast. Look at the depth of it. Now, we may as well chop and change swims and put rods all over the place, but I'll tell you what, for me, Dino's diary's done. But for the rest of the boys, I really do hope the evening brings one of these for them. Because there's a few more out there, trust me. That is absolutely huge. It is as wide as my quadricep. <laughs> Just hold them until they kick off nice and strong. Oh, there you go. Look at it. Oh, it's a beastie. And another for Rooney, and saw us into the evening in style. And as night fell, Nigel Swim came alive with this beauty. And with the start of a new day, the action continued. Well, we all love it when a plan works, and just as I hoped, as the light went down, the barbel came out to play. Dino, Rooney and, and Gazza, they did really well during the daytime yesterday, but on dark, the fish that moved down to me. I had one just on dark, a small one. Then I had a 9.8 at 11 o'clock last night. And then at half 11, same rod went again, 11.12. Absolute magic. Stood out there in the river, playing it in the dark, holding station, so exciting. Had to wake Dino up from the dead to take a picture, but I got one. And we came for a social and just to round it off, I had another one at half seven this morning. Absolute perfection. Topped off by Rooney, who achieved an angling ambition. When Dean rang me and said, do you fancy fishing Collingham Weir? I was like, yes, get me there. Didn't realise I'd have to wait two years for this day to come, but it's been a brilliant trip. A few of the Guru lads have come along, come to see what we can catch. Everyone knows how famous this weir is and the great species that are in it. And to top it all off, I've been able to bring the 14 foot Aventus distance rods to see how they cope in these conditions. There's gonna be no better test. And to be honest, I've caught plenty of barbel, including my personal best of 11.7 over the moon. The end of the session was fast approaching. But with plenty of action and PBs to boot, this was the session we would all remember. Well, our Collingham adventure is coming to an end and quite frankly, surprisingly enough, the big one for me wasn't the highlight. That, sharing this experience with my friends, is what it's all about. <laughs>